This is week four, uh, real estate, regulation, and enterprise. I'm seated here in Evans Hall, which is the new Yale School of Management building that just opened this year. I'm seated in the Zhang Auditorium, which was a gift of one of our students. So real estate or property, this is uh, one of the most important assets, probably the most important asset class in the world. It's generally privately held. Now, in some countries, it may not be technically privately held. In China today, all of the land is technically owned by the government, but people are able to own rights to use the land. So in effect, they practically own the land, and they actively buy and sell these rights. Land is very important, and real estate includes beyond land. It includes structures and improvements for land. Private ownership of land, or real estate more generally, is something that has been discovered by governments all over the world because it makes some essential good sense. Land and property has to be defended and maintained. Private ownership gives an incentive for someone to be very vigilant and careful. Even rental properties are generally privately owned. So there is a, there is a owner who is watching the property and develops a relation with the tenants, uh, generally a trusting relation that develops so that the property is cared for properly. Unfortunately, real estate investment is very, or real estate is a very political aspect of finance. And that's because people, <laughs> especially homeowners, vote. Their, their sense of connection to a political unit is defined generally by the place where they own property. So politicians like to support real estate causes because it's a it can re uh, strengthens their their political support. This week, I give some examples of um, real estate uh, government interaction. Notably, I talk about the uh, uh, founding of Fannie Mae, that was uh, technically called Federal National Mortgage Association in 1938, which was a program where the government would subsidize real estate, both homeowner and rental real estate. Not surprising that they would do that in 1938. That was the Great Depression, and the construction sector was very hard hit by the Depression, and they wanted to get these people back to work. Not surprising, but they never ended the, uh, uh, the, the, the um, additional subsidy. They also, in the U.S. in 1934, created the Federal Housing Administration, which ensures mortgages against default of the, of the homeowner. And uh, that is the government taking on risk of the mortgage market as a way of subsidizing the housing market. Now, when I gave these lectures that you'll see later this week in 2011, we had just learned <laughs> about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac being bankrupt. The government had to take them over. after. You know, the better part of a century, they finally went under. <laughs> but what I didn't say in the lectures in 2011 was that the other major innovation by the government in the 1930s, the Federal Housing Administration, also went bankrupt. That happened after I gave the lectures in 2013, and the Federal Housing Administration had to be bailed out by the government. So far, to the tune of $1.7 billion, even though they had raised their premiums and tried to survive. The FHA is, was supposed to be a self-supporting institution, technically part of the government, but sort of like a private company. It had to be bailed out anyway. Let's not overreact to these bailouts. The government sets up organizations. They might be you know, a government-sponsored enterprise or part of the government to manage certain risks, and sometimes they, uh, they mess up. <laughs> but, uh, it's some, a matter of concern, but it's not a matter of uh, uh, 
ultimate criticism of, of what they do. So what I'm talking here in this part of the, about of the uh, course is about mortgage institutions and more broadly about financial institutions that manage risk. And some of these risks are associated with major crises, like the financial crisis that peaked in 2008 and became a, a world crisis. And it's about regulation. And it's about government uh, agencies that would help regulate, uh, regulate uh, activities of businesses. But beyond that, it's al also uh, uh, outside the government, like we'll talk about the uh, FASB, which is the uh, FASB, which is the uh, non-government set, setter of uh, accounting standards in, in the United States. Beyond that, I think that there's a lot of different forces that, that help regulate our business sector uh, that are defined in terms of financial interests and in terms of people who, who take a financial interest and then are incentivized to take responsibility. Uh, so the perfect example of this is the outside lecturer that we have, uh, Carl Icahn. Uh, 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 like Laura Cha, he couldn't make it uh, to New Haven, but we did a, a, a video hookup and the Icahn talked to our class. And I think it was a very amusing uh, lecture that he gave, M amusing and important. So uh, ICON is a sort of <laughs> self-appointed regulator. What he does, and he's been doing it for much of his life, is he, he buys an interest in companies that he thinks are not managed well. And if you hear him talk, there are a lot of companies <coughs> that are not managed well. The management might get entrenched and too comfortable and too interested in playing golf with each other and not willing to make hard decisions. So he goes in and makes the hard decisions. Uh, to me, uh, looking at him, he seems to be the ultimate realist. Uh, you know, he, it, there's no uh, uh, window dressing there. He sort of likes to tell things as they are. Uh, and I'm sure he's offended some people greatly who told them they weren't managing their firms right. And I'm sure he's not always right. But as one of the richest then in America, I think that he's, uh, he's been a, a quite a success. Uh, so it's an interesting story. But the, th this uh, leads then into another, I think, should be considered an important theme of this course. And it is about what is all of this finance about? What good is it? Now, there's a perception among many of our students here that finance is about just making money. And there is a assumption that anyone who was a good, decent person wouldn't go into finance because they should go into one of the helping professions, being a nice person, uh, going into things like teaching or nursing. Well, I think that's absolutely right. We need lots of people in those caring professions. And I think it's wonderful if people want to do that. But I don't think it's evil to go into finance either. In fact, quite the opposite. There might almost be a moral imperative for someone of talent in business to do just that to help promote causes, ultimately to promote causes. Because I think that people who make a lot of money end up giving it away, or at least they should end up giving it away. So I thought uh, we might mention some examples <laughs> <coughs> and the first example that uh, comes to mind is Carl Icahn, since we uh, will hear him speak. Uh, Icahn is an important philanthropist. He's been giving money to health care, like Mount Sinai Hospital, or giving money to genomics research, uh, among, amongst other things, some kind of community spirit things, like Icahn Stadium. Uh, I s mentioned that we are sitting now in Evans Hall. Uh, well, why is it called Evans Hall at Yale? It's because Edward P. Evans gave the money, uh, it was a, f a $50 million gift to Yale, to build a new management school. 
Evans it was the CEO of Macmillan, which was a publishing company, well, is a publishing company that in the past published a lot of our great authors like C. P. Snow, Rabindranath Tagore, William Butler Yeats, and the economist John Maynard Keynes. So he parlayed an intellectual publishing business into a, a, a source of money for a management school, which trains people to go into management with a, with a sen sense of good purpose. This auditorium, uh, called the Zhang Auditorium, is a gift of one of our students, Mr. Lei Zhang, from China. Uh, so he gave over $8 million to Yale to build this auditorium that I'm sitting in now. Uh, it, it may seem odd. Why would someone from China give money to the United States, to some place in the United States? Well, I think it can go in many different directions. That in modern financial capitalism, people develop a sense of purpose in life, and everyone is different, but we'll see opportunities to give money ultimately to a use that strikes them as a good one. And the last example I want to give is Yale University. The original gift that created Yale University came from a Mr. Elihu Yale, who was governor of Madras in India, and a businessman, a successful businessman, who never even came to New Haven. He just decided uh, in his will to give money to found the, this new university. Uh, so this is, this is the way I think we should be thinking about a life in business or finance. It, that's the way we should be thinking. I'm not saying everyone thinks of it this way, but a lot of people do. It's an opportunity to take a role in advancing society. And that means you have to take control of the levers of control and the levers of control in modern financial capitalism are financial levers. The power that you get in learning how to use them is not evil. It's a question of your own moral standards and how you will make your use of such levers a good and purposeful one.